Hello, everyone. I think we we'll start the meeting now. Hello. Um, good to see so many people turning up. Um, really good. Um, as you can tell, there's a new addition to the EV group uh, here, a uh, little fin named after the veins on a heat sink. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, so hello. There we go. Um, and to all those people in internet land, there he is. There we go. All right. Well, enough of the frivolities. The serious business of electric vehicles. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Nice turnout. It seems that um, the battery end of the technology is something that uh, sparks everyone's interest, if I can use the pun. Um, you'll hear all the latest current technology from uh, Paul this evening, if I can throw in another pun. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get on to that in a minute. Um, first, I'd just like to uh, let people know about how you can stay connected with the, with the EV group. Um, we've got... Um, uh, Facebook uh, open group, which is uh, the ATA Melbourne EV branch. So uh, if you go to ATA Melbourne EV branch, then you can um, see everything's happening on happening, and we uh, we post all the latest bits and pieces up on on the uh, the face crack site. So um, feel free to peruse that and post up anything that you'd uh, that you want to put up there yourself. Uh, also, you can catch up with us on. Um, on the ATA, Alternative Technology Association website, so that's ata.org.au, uh, and just follow the links to uh, this Melbourne EV branch. Um, for those that have uh, missed um, any of the past, uh, any of the past uh, seminars that we've had here, then uh, you can see them all on our YouTube channel. So again, just go to ATA Melbourne EV Branch uh, on YouTube and not only can you see uh, us broadcasting live, hello, um, but uh, you can have a look at um, past, uh, past seminars uh, over the last couple of years. Um, we also have uh, uh, the uh, Renew and, uh, and also Sanctuary magazines that are put out by the ATA. Uh, well worth a, a read. You can get them here from from us for cheap, or uh, from uh, from your news agents for more expensive. So uh, feel free to grab a grab a copy here, because the money that uh, that you give for these magazines here goes to the CB group. So uh, so we can have uh, more upper class tea and bickies later, uh, and other things. Um, okay, uh, first. Um, uh, apologies for, for those that might have turned up last week and found uh, us all uh, not here. Uh, we had a wrong date on it. We're just in the process of changing over from our old secretary, who now has a new job as mother, uh, and to our new secretary, Adrian Cohen. So a big applause for Adrian Cohen. <laughs> He's been uh, with the EV group. Uh, since Adam was a lad, and he's done an excellent job. Always here with the AV, uh, consistent, uh, good man, and uh, looking forward to his secretarial involvement. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Also, past events. Um, I haven't really got much of a list of past events that's been going on, but uh, what has been brought, been brought to my attention is that uh, Tesla has unveiled their... Uh, supercharged network across the USA and had a launch uh, uh, a week or two ago um, where they drove a couple of uh, their uh, their cars across uh, the US and uh, apparently it all went um, all went very well and uh, so hopefully that uh, dispels some of the range anxiety um, fears that uh, some punters may have. Uh, the Tesla as you know is a, is a quality car and uh, quite a range and uh, if anyone wants to buy me one um, come and see me later I'll gratefully uh, accept it no questions asked <coughs> um, as far as future events um, the only thing that I know of which is uh, half related would be um, a Velo in the Park event that will have some uh, electric bicycles and electric tricycles at it in Adelaide on the 8th of May um, 
Now, I'm just wondering if anyone here has any um, knowledge of past or future events that we could be uh, alerted to and spread the uh, spread the news. <coughs> Abe is holding a annual EV festival to Melbourne this year. So it looks like we're being COVID on the 25th and 26th of October. 25th and 26th of October for the Australian Electric Vehicle Association's uh, uh, AGM and, uh, festival. and festival <laughs> and seminar, right. And so Coburg, Coburg hey? Yeah. We could. Everyone turn up. Yeah, well, we'll all be there um, and and more for sure. So yeah, that's something to look forward to. Uh, the AEVA do a good job and uh, well worth supporting. Um, okay, uh, now any news about um, things that are happening in people's garages? Ah, uh, yes. One outside, uh, you can have a look at Mitsubishi PHEV. Uh, Mitsubishi PHEV. Oh, very nice. Oh, wicked! All right. Well, um, make sure that we uh, that uh, that we get a bit of a, a, a look at that um, before before it's all over this evening. Um, fantastic. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. Oh, well done. And so, and how has it been performing for you so far? Good. Uh, 25k range flavored. Mm -hmm. Some half. Uh, about 40 plus. Five and five Swings back in the left. Uh, what I didn't read anywhere is they run down the highway in mechanical drive. Oh. Once you get over about 65 k's, it actually keep you. If you're in battery mode, it runs full time, full time. But once you run out of battery, then the motor starts up and it shows it mechanically driving the front wheels, unless you need more power, in which case then the back motor kicks in. And if you've really got more power, everything kicks in. Right, okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Quite impressed with the way it works electrically. It's, oh. it's an electric vehicle first and a hybrid second. Right. Lovely. Well, and certainly like to. Like when you burn in, like you're running out of battery. Yeah. When you get to your town, and if that bit of slowing down or whatever is quite enough, often enough to do half a k or more in the electric motor, particularly if you're going slow, even kilometer or two. Yeah. So yeah, it's very good. I've only had it today, so. Oh, uh, okay. Don't okay. run a case in my house today. Oh, still giving it a good, uh, good workout already. Fantastic. Oh, well, that's lovely to hear that. Uh, that uh, the Outlanders uh, got a Guernsey here amongst the the group. Um, yeah, we'll all uh, love to uh, stick our head under the bonnet and uh, and see how it all how looks much? and feels. What was the price? Uh, Fifty thousand. You can buy the luxury one for another five thousand dollars more if you feel inclined. Uh -huh. All right, fantastic. Oh, that's really good. Um, any other? Uh, um, uh, past, future events, or any stuff around the garages. Anyone working on their vehicles at the moment? Um, repairing, upgrading, converting? No, it's getting a bit cold now, I think, uh, to be in the garage. Um, when you don't have a big, thirsty ICE engine keeping you warm. <laughs> um, all right, well, I think that... Um, my part of the of the evening is uh, is over. Is there any other things that I've missed? Not that I can think of. Um, right. Well, uh, I'd just like to introduce uh, Paul Patton, who's been a long-time member of the EV group, a very industrious uh, and innovative uh, person who uh, I call my battery guru because any time um, I need to know something about a battery, why it's working the way it does, or more importantly, why it's not working the way it should. Um, then Paul is the one who's been able to uh, to help me out. Um, uh, I've uh, much respect for his uh, knowledge uh, in the world of uh, of batteries, and uh, we're uh, pleased and privileged to be able to uh, to hear what he's got to say today. So. Um, Paul, please step up and take it away. Okay. Thank no you, Dean. No worries. Thank you.
Thank you and welcome you all tonight to those. I've done a presentation on um, some of the different batteries that are used in electric vehicles. We're going to look at a bit of the history of, um, of the batteries that have been in vehicles and then move on to what's available on that at the moment. So as we see here, go on to the first slide. As we know, the electric vehicle industry started in the turn of the century on those, and they were building electric cars around that time. On those, it was actually more popular than the uh, petrol car at that time. And I've got a video here of an early electric car. This is one of the Detroit electrics. So I managed to find a video of it on those, so we can see one going. A car like this operates on uh, lead acid batteries. So these were the first batteries that were used in electric vehicles. So this is the type of performance that you can expect you know, from a lead acid type vehicle. It's got the door closed. <laughs> So someone's restored this lovely antique car. So lead acid batteries were the first practical battery system that could be used in an electric vehicle. Uh, good for limited range, low speed. Stop that one. Yep. So back to the presentation. So the very first battery that was used was a lead, was a lead acid battery, uh, very limited range, about 40 kilometres range. That car was a 24 volt system. Okay, we can go on to the next slide now. So I'm going to show some of the, the later type battery systems that are used in vehicles. But I thought I'd bring the slide up first before I show you some of the newer vehicles, just to show you what what the um, energy capacity is of the different types of battery systems. The lead acid battery here starts at 40 kilowatts, 40 watt hours per kilogram. The nickel metal hydride, which has already doubled that, that capacity, so you can get twice the range or twice the energy out of a kilogram of batteries. We then move to lithium phosphate, which was um, another early type of electric vehicle battery going up to 100. This one here, NMC, is actually uh, lithium, nickel, manganese, co cobalt. Um, this is quite a common battery that's used now. It's used in the LEAF and in the IME on those. So it's actually the most popular, I think, of the current um, lithium ion type batteries. Then we go up in energy again to the lithium cobalt. This is the lithium cobalt was the original lithium ion battery that was developed um, for laptops and for consumer appliances on those. It was developed quite some time ago, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, it's still a very it's a powerful, uh, very useful type of battery to use in a vehicle. And then of course, top of the range at the moment now is the NCR battery, which um, is manufactured by Panasonic. It's actually an improvement on lithium cobalt, or it is really a lithium cobalt battery, but with a few other changes to it. Aluminium has been added into the formula. But uh, the NCR, well, that's the battery that's used in the Tesla Model X. So I noticed so you can see how its power density then compares to some of the other um, the batteries. That's the best available at the moment. I think we'll go on to the next slide. What does NCR stand for? Um, it's an abbreviation that. I'm not really sure that Panasonic have given to it. The NCR type batteries have uh, additional protection in them. The polymer layer in them is less resistant to heat. So they can be run hotter than lithium cobalt batteries before they catch fire. So there's been some additional safety precautions that uh, Panasonic has put into the lithium cobalt battery uh, when they developed the NCR to make it safer than what the lithium cobalt battery was. So now we're moving to 1999, and this is when electric vehicles really started to get moving. General Motors made the EV1, 
um, I've picked a Generation 2 EV1 because this is the very first car that used the nickel metal hydride battery. So as we saw from the previous previous graph, we've already doubled the ens energy density of the battery. We've now gone to nickel metal hydride. And this is an example of the nickel metal hydride type range. We've now got a range up to 170 kilometres and acceleration of the car is you know, similar to a, what a four-cylinder sedan would do. So if you could play that video. No, it's the wrong video. It's the EV1. Three. Two. Three. Two. Evil ranking for yet the smog. LA is going to be seen from the tyranny of the V8 engine. So this is Los Angeles in the 90s, when they wanted to do something about pollution. America's big seven automated bus producing some zero emission cars. GM got them first. This is a nickel metal hydride type car. Traffic lights. <laughs> and the nickel metal hydride car still was fast enough to win. For those any irritated enough to want to know, the EV1 weighs 3,000 pounds as well as battery. It has the aerodynamics of a hyper jet with a landing gear that literally, and its practical range, even though the atmosphere is 90, can actually about 40 to 50 miles per hour. There's one guy at home who bought a Polaroid snack. Dealership to show that he actually achieved 101 miles of full charge. I am so lucky. So, what do I think? Well, it's actually very quiet, very refined, very quick, and very drivable. In essence, that's all we do with the car. But the battery sucks, the range is appalling, and if you had to buy one, it would cost a whopping 35,000 pounds. But let me leave you with this thought. Ten years ago, the mobile phones were the size of suitcases and cost two thousand pounds. Today, they're the size of calculators, and they're giving them away. Make no mistake, the days of the internal combustion engine are definitely numbered. Yes. Yes. So that was the 1990s, or was it? nearly 2000, on those when um, that was the type of car that GM was able to produce at that particular time. So nickel metal hydride battery. See the range, 170 kilometres, reasonable acceleration on those, so that was where we were up to at that time. We'll go to the next slide. And then the introduction of the lithium cobalt battery. The lithium cobalt battery came out of, um, well, consumer electronics. It was a high energy battery, went into laptops, went into mobile phones. Uh, it was a real step forward on those in battery development. And those, so the Alika in 2004 was able to be built with a range of 310 kilometers, very good acceleration. And this is a little bit about um, Japanese, the Japanese who developed one of the first lithium ion cars. Did you play that video? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
a streamlined car flashes by at over 300 kilometers per hour. But there's no sound in the engine. The Alika has eight motors. It's eight wheels with a hub motor in each wheel. In February 2004, Sidney's test drive of the Alika began an attack in Tochini Prefecture. Four hundred kilometers per hour is even higher than the speeds reached in Formula One. Kilometers per hour at just seven point zero. So this was an acceleration test against the Porsche. During one hundred and thirty-eight kilometers per hour, the Porsche doesn't reach one hundred and sixty kilometers per hour until the nine point two second mark. So even with no gearbox, the electric vehicle was still able to out-accelerate um, a Porsche up to, up to 160 kilometres an hour. Now this is interesting, this is some of the batteries that were used within the vehicle. These are lithium iron or lithium uh, cobalt batteries, one of the standard batteries of the consumer industry. But I also thought it was interesting to note that the batteries actually slide underneath the body. So like this was one of the first cars where they put the batteries in the floor, under the, under the, flo under the floor of the car. The car has 320 of these batteries. Large lithium ion batteries are not yet mass produced. So the number needed to power one car currently costs almost 20 million yen. Lots of batteries and a reasonable amount of weight. So with the Alika car, they were looking for a company that could supply them with batteries. And they actually went to China and they found out that the same development, the same thing was happening in China. So in China, companies like BYD and that were looking at developing electric cars for the Chinese market. The battery maker has accomplished all this in just two years. This speed of development has been spurred by China's severe air pollution problems. Electric cars help limit emissions. There's a big demand for them in China. Okay, let's go back. So that was what was capable, what they were capable of building in 2004 with the um, invention of the lithium cobalt battery. We'll go to the next slide. And then 2011, the next car that I'm looking at is the Nissan Leaf. I've chosen Nissan Leaf because it was a very popular car. We're going to do the Roadster first. We skipped a slide. We skipped a slide, okay. Um, the Roadster was the first commercial vehicle to use lithium cobalt batteries. So in the Roadster I noticed that the battery system actually went behind the back seat. It was in a module behind the back seat. And I suppose it was when, when Tesla, Tesla went to the Model S and they put it in the floor that they were starting to get problems with um, some, something piercing the battery from below and causing a battery fire. But in the Tesla Roadster it was actually enclosed behind the back seat. It was in the back part of the car. But uh, this is a car typically that's built with a lithium cobalt batteries, range of 320 kilometres and uh, good acceleration. So by 2008 this is where we got to with cars and with batteries. And the car really represents the battery, you know, um, the design of the car, how well the car performs is dependent mostly on the battery. Can you show this video? Go to this one now. For some people, Tesla is going to be all about the numbers. 
200 miles of range from almost 7,000 lithium ion batteries. 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. Over 1,200 cars already sold to environmentally conscious customers who are looking for a way to reduce their impact on the planet. So he's describing a little bit like the flight to driver Tesla on those and you know the EV grin, the electric power that you get from the motor. Not only is it fast, it's enjoyable to drive. There are plenty of fast cars out there that aren't a lot of fun to drive. This is not one of those. What primarily makes it fun is that character of the electric motor. <laughs> This is a completely different, completely new type of performance. With this car, we've got the instant torque of the electric motor. We've got the very futuristic style, the very futuristic interior, and it feels postmodern. It just feels right. To me, this is a better and more enjoyable car than a Lotus Elise. Of course, it's awesome. So now we've got a range of 320 kilometers, excellent range, and 0 to 100 k's in 3.7 seconds. So beating the performance really of the best petrol cars at that stage. Next slide. Now we've moved to 2011, and a new battery has been introduced around this time. The lithium cobalt, of course, has been around for quite some time. But now we've got a new battery coming out. This is the one that we call the trimetal battery or lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt. Um, it's another form of lithium ion chem chemistry and it has a longer life than lithium, uh, lithium cobalt. So the life expectancy you would have of these batteries would still be in the order of 8 to 12 years. You would expect to get out of a, a battery like that in a vehicle. Whereas the lithium cobalt batteries, yeah, 3 to 5 years, Eight years if you were treating the battery carefully, you know, it's the sort of life that you expect. But that wasn't really long enough. It wasn't long enough for what the consumer and that expected. They wanted a longer life. They wanted to. They didn't want to have to think that in five years they would have to then buy another battery. You know, why have an electric car in that case? Whereas these these particular batteries, the trimetal batteries, on those they've been introduced into e-bikes as well as um, cars. You know, are a longer life type battery and middle of the range, reasonable performance on those with longer life. So now in the Nissan Leaf, we've got a range of 190 kilometres. So they've brought the range back on those to a more reasonable level, but they've made the car more affordable and reasonable acceleration, you know, similar to, similar to a four cylinder type car. So if you could play that video. So this is the sort of car that you get with a nickel manganese um, oxide battery. Carolyn, that motor is an 80 kilowatt unit powered by 48 separate lithium ion batteries like what's in your laptop with a total of 24 kilowatt hours of storage capacity, 107 horsepower, 207 foot pounds of torque. You see these are torquey machines. It's a 3400 pound car to 60 in about seven seconds and a range is a funny word. Click on that on the Nissan Leaf site, and you don't get a number, you get this convoluted look at the thing, this graphic. That's <laughs> it's very hard to predict the range on an electric vehicle. Because it really depends on how you drive it. Depending on terrain, conditions, how you drive, even the weather. So that's one thing that we find, like we build battery packs in that for electric bikes and things, and, um, you know, and people say, well, what's the range? Well, it really depends on how you ride it. On those, you know, we can quote a range, but uh, it's only an, an estimate. So we'll go on to the next slide. Now we have the uh, the NCR batteries, the ones that we're talking about on those, which is the the best of the batteries that are currently available at the moment: lithium, nickel, cobalt, aluminium. On those. The uh, Panasonic have added aluminium to the formula to make the batteries last a bit longer than what uh, lithium cobalt did. So they're looking at a, a life of 8 to 10 years, as what we'd typically expect with the Model S. 
but they're still a high energy battery, a battery that uh, has the highest energy density of all of them. With a battery like this, you know, Tesla's now capable of producing a car with a range of 460 kilometers, um, excellent acceleration, you know, a really good car. So once these batteries and that have been developed, this is the type of car that they're capable of building. So we'll have a look at that video. Tesla believed it can lead a revolution and change the face of motoring forever. It's the first ever mass made premium sedan powered purely by electricity. Designed to have speed and range and not a drop of gas. Our goal is to create an electric car that is the best car in the world and show that that's what an electric car can be. A family sedan that can go from 0 to 100 in under 6 seconds and further on a single charge than any other electric production car. Designed to match the top gasoline competitors. The Model S has free space for a floor of points. They use thousands of small lithium ion cells, similar to laptop batteries. Thanks to these regular batteries, the company say the Model S has achieved a top range of 480 kilowatts. The high performance battery pack is formed with only 7,000 small cells. They're organized into a plot layer with specific groupings of positive and negative. A few years from now, Tesla will change the perception of what mainstream cars can be. So now we've got the nickel, uh, lithium, nickel, cobalt, aluminium batteries. So I know it's the, the latest formula that Panasonic has produced. I suppose um, Tesla are using the small batteries, the 18650 format, mainly because they can be manufactured very cheaply. On those, they can then use the, the mass production manufacturing that is currently being used for laptops and for other battery purposes. And that very small battery also um, is able to dissipate heat very well. Because it's small in size and it has a large surface area, it's able to dissipate any heat that's generated within the battery. So it's, it's an additional safety requirement as well. But um, so that's the batteries and that, that's the current um, best batteries and that that are available at the moment. Go to the next one. <coughs> now I'll put this one in because this is a typical um, home conversion. You know, we're now, we've been talking about cars that have been commercially produced, but this is a car that someone's produced at home. They've put a few uh, LEFPO4 batteries in them which are actually designed as um, for the uh, stationary, for the stationary energy industry, they put those batteries in, and just to show what sort of performance they were getting and, and what they've done there. So, this video will show more of a homebrew type setup and what's happening with homebrew brew type cars. All day, the actual electrical start. All the major components were chosen, purchased, and installed in the next couple of months. And even though the electric summer is currently in operational, it is still very far from being done. <coughs> one of the main reasons for all the work I had is that one of my original goals for this vehicle is not being met. I originally set out to build a vehicle that would drive 100 miles or more to be charges. Its current form, the summer, has given me a maximum of 65 mile range. Even though there are things I can currently do to improve this. I'm cutting down drag by installing 20 out of the 23 windows. <laughs> <laughs> Just about cut all the frame out of the body. My range goal has been changed. The current 21 kilowatt hour lithium ion phosphate battery is something bigger than the gas light. He wants a bit more range. The problem is that even more battles consider old technology for this generation lithium, the 
it's still rather expensive. The energy density is not the best with 90 to 110 watt hours per kilowatt. That means that my 22 kilowatt hour battery comes in at 480 pounds and occupies all the area where the old gas tank used to be, plus all the facades. Your space. If I want to meet my 100 mile range target using the Vicomar phosphate, I will have to spend roughly another $7,000 and get really creative finding space for all those initial cells. So the alternative is to look at another chemistry, like the one used on the best energy crop today. That would be lithium cobalt cells used by Tesla, first on the Goldstein and now on the Model S. They use mass produced cylindrical 18650 cells commonly found in cordless power tubes and electrical batteries. They are small in size, very light, very powerful. The cost is about the same as lithium iron phosphate. The advantage of lithium cobalt is that it comes in about half the weight and size, allowing my supplement to go for it using a battery with roughly the same physical size and weight of the present. So Tesla has designed very clever ways to build safety features into the battery class. One of the most unique and clever safety features is a cell that will fuse before the battery. Each one of the cell thousand cells used in the battery. There's a fuse on each cell of the Tesla battery. Which measures the Tesla battery have pictures all of them? It looks like they use a very simple voltage wire. When they assemble a Tesla battery pack, they put a fuse in every single cell. So it's experimenting with different wires to work out the fuse, the particular fuse that he wants to use. And he's going to put a fuse in every one of those cells. Lots of batteries, isn't it? It's a big pack. We almost lost the field right here. <coughs> so that's interesting there. So someone who's built um, a homebrew car with LEFPO4 batteries wanted to try and extend its range. Is it on? Is it on a limited budget? It's only got so much money to spend and also so much room within the car and then trying to work out how he can increase the range on that of this car. And uh, that particular guy is actually using second-hand laptop batteries. He's um, getting batteries from I don't know where and then testing them on those, testing them for internal resistance, testing them for their capacity on those and then building up battery packs and that out, out of those. So um, that was one way of looking at extending the range on that of this car. So if you um, don't have the budget for new batteries, there's always other sources, there's other places in that that you can find them. We'll go on to the next slide. Also from that slide too, I, sorry, the individual, individual fusing that um, Tesla do on their battery packs. When you've got so many batteries like that, all are connected in parallel on those and um, Say in the Tesla Model S, if you get an impact from underneath the car and one or two of the batteries are punctured or damaged in some ways, the individual fusing then just disconnects those cells. And because there's virtually 100, 200 of them in parallel, it would really make very little difference to the pack. Or if one of the cells was to uh, break down or blow for some particular reason, you know, that the fuse will just take it out of the circuit and then the others will just uh, continue on. So that's one safety feature that Tesla have put in their cars on those with all of the cells, you know, lots of little batteries. They uh, individually fuse them. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this slide now. So this one really shows the story. As you can see there, the diff different energy densities that are available for the current uh, batteries that are available on the moment. Nickel metal hydrides, quite close to lithium ion phosphate. Very similar in energy density, a slight increase through there. So lithium phosphate has the lowest energy density of all of the lithium um, chemistries. It's a battery that was actually designed for the um, stationary storage, for um, the battery backups, for um, storage packs that are used in uninterruptible power supplies and 
It's used as a storage battery. And then we have NMC, which is the nickel manganese cobalt. This one is actually the most popular of the current batteries. It's used in the uh, IME, it's used in the LEAF, and a lot of the other car manufacturers. Actually, the, um, the motorbike. It's a Brembo or Bremen? Bremen. Bremen, is it? Bremen, yep, the new motorbike now. They've changed to uh, NMC batteries now in the Remo, in, in the current model. I know, so this battery is um, taking over at the moment. It seems to be the most economical in that in the commercial market. And then you have the higher energy batteries that are available as well, which is lithium cobalt and um, Panasonic's NCR. There actually is a competitor to Panasonic in the NCR. Um, Samsung also make the same high quality battery as well. I think theirs is called ICR, ICR 188650. Um, so they do have a competing manufacturer. We'll go on to the next slide. So this is a bit explaining what a lithium ion battery is. They're rechargeable batteries, as we know, because you have two types of batteries. You have non-rechargeable and rechargeable. And we're, we're really mainly interested in the rechargeable ones. They consist of an anode, dissolved in carbon, and then they have a cathode material, which is the lithium cobalt, or one of those materials that we were talking about. So those two materials is what makes the battery work. Because what a battery is, is it really it just stores energy in a chemical form. So in this case, it's electricity. It's storing electricity due to its electrical, due to its chemical process. Go to the next slide. If you're interested, there's the reaction the chemical formula that makes a lithium-ion battery work. But the main thing I want to talk about this is it's reversible. This is how it works. The uh, chemical reaction goes one way when it's charging, and the chemical reaction goes the other way when it discharges. So that's how all batteries work, and those, and it's a particular chemistry that's used within the battery that gives it its, um, its performance. Next. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about BMSs on those and some of the BMSs that are uh, in the battery packs because um, it's another issue that's associated with, uh, with the vehicle. Yes? Um, on the, uh, the point of the charge and discharge, do the different chemistries um, uh, have different efficiencies in the charge-discharge cycle? Yes, yes they do. Uh, the lithium-ion chemistries, pretty well across the all across the range have almost 100% efficiency in their charge and discharge, whereas um, nickel metal hydride had a much lower efficiency in charge and discharge, maybe 70 or 80%. So nickel metal hydride batteries, when you charge them and discharge them, they get hot. And you might have noticed that uh, quite often there are fans and that in the nickel metal hydride system. But the lithium ion battery was an improvement there. It's very close to 100%. And you can charge a lithium-ion battery and it does not heat up. But if you charge it rapidly, like in a half hour um, type, um, trying to do a quick charge on it, it will produce some heat. So the BMS. Well, the BMS has three functions within the battery pack. There are three things that are required for lithium-ion batteries to keep them healthy. Low voltage protection to stop discharge if one of the batteries falls below its minimum operating voltage. If you run a lithium ion battery to zero or just past zero, it'll uh, destroy the battery. But even then, we don't want to run it near zero. We want to have a safety factor there. So there's a minimum operating voltage. High voltage protection to protect the battery when it's being charged because some of the individual batteries in that pack might charge faster than others on those and their voltage rises too high. So the BMS also has to give protection on the battery pack when it's charging, so the individual batteries don't overcharge. And then the last function of the BMS is a balance function. And what the balance does is uh, to keep all the battery packs at the same voltage by distributing the charge throughout the entire pack so that all the batteries have a similar rate of charge in them. Um, the balance function also is very important to keep the battery healthy. Because if a battery goes out of balance, um, when you charge it, some of the cells will go too high. 
or if the battery is out of balance, when you discharge it, some of the low batteries will actually go flat. So it's balance is an important function. Now here we are, we've got two different types of batteries and I'm comparing the charge, the actual charge um, curves for two different batteries. With the LAFPO4 battery, once it's charged, it reaches about 3.5, 3.55 volts. And then if you continue to overcharge it, it will very quickly rise above 4 volts, uh, whereby the battery will be starting to, uh, starting to be damaged. It'll uh, start to age prematurely from overcharging. So at 100% charge, it's at about 3. Point, just on 3.5 volts. Whereas all the other lithium ion batteries, which is lithium cobalt, LiPo, uh, the NMC type batteries, they have a different charge curve. As they approach 100% charge, their um, charge curve is quite flat and they can be overcharged quite considerably um, before any damage occurs. So I, this charge characteristic is very important because it does show a safety factor in the lithium ion, in the lithium cobalt battery when it's overcharged, whereas with the LAF PO4, if you overcharge it, uh, unless the BMS protects the battery, it'll be damaged very quickly. Uh, damaging voltage at 3% overcharge. Here, with the lithium ion battery, about it'll take an overcharge of 24%. They actually make lithium ion batteries of this type that are 4.35 volts, that are actually designed to be charged to 4.35 volts. Um, whereas the standard lithium ion battery charges to 4.2 volts. So uh, there is safety within the chemistry to actually produce batteries that charge for high voltages um, in that particular chemistry. Go to the next one. And then we have the discharge curves and that of the two different batteries. And those and they're quite different as well. The lithium ion battery starts, oh, this is the lithium cobalt and all the other chemistries. They start at 4.2 volts and then they discharge to around 3 volts. They're considered flat between 4.2 and 3 volts. Whereas the LAFPO4 has a more flat discharge characteristic. It's fully charged at about 3.4, 3.45 volts, it's fully charged, and then it's considered flat at around 3 volts, 3 to 2.8. It's considered flat with a LAFPO4. But the reason that I've um, shown this curve is to talk about how the BMS operates on those. And uh, one of the most important functions of a battery is it has to be kept in balance. Because if, some, if the battery's not in balance, if there's more charge in one cell than another, um, when you fully charge the battery, you're going to have problems of overcharging. And when you fully discharge it, you will have some cells that will go flat. So the actual balance of the battery is extremely important on those in maintaining the life within the battery. Now I've quoted here 40% depth of discharge and 60% depth of discharge, just as two points, two points of reference on the curve. And we can see with the Elliott PO4 battery, at 40% discharge, the battery is at 3.34 volts. At 60% discharge, it's at 3.32 volts. So we're only get a difference of 0.02 of a volt between 40 and 60% uh, discharge on the battery. With a lithium ion battery, 40% discharge, it's 3.2 volts. 60% discharge, it's 3.63 volts. It's a much wider difference in voltage, 0.11 of a volt, 0.02 of a volt. And why I've mentioned that is um, the BMS now is trying to keep that battery balanced. It's trying to keep the battery within balance. Mm -hmm. But between 40% discharge and 60% discharge on the LEFPO4 battery, the 0.02 volt difference will not be picked up by the BMS. Um, commercial BMSs aren't able to pick up such a very small difference in voltage. So the BMS will have will not be able to keep um, all the cells completely balanced within the LAFPO4 battery on those. Whereas in the lithium ion battery, because of the uh, 
extra difference in voltage, the BMS will be able to easily keep the battery balanced. So an LAF PO4 battery could have individual cells, individual batteries in the pack, 20% out of balance, and the BMS function wouldn't correct it. So this is one of the problems that you have with LAF PO4 batteries, is that um, it's very difficult to keep the battery balanced on those and the BMS systems um, can't keep them balanced. And as the battery drifts out of balance, uh, then wear starts to occur on individual cells within the battery and the battery then starts to fail early. So the discharge curve, even though the lithium ion has a much wider range of operating voltage and you might get really good performance when it's fully charged and when it's going down to nearly flat, you know, your motor is going to run slower because of lower voltage. It is an easier battery to keep in balance and to keep functioning properly. Go on to the next slide. So some of the conclusions from that. With LAF PO4 batteries, uh, the BMS must be of a very high standard uh, and has a lot more stress on it than in the other lithium ion chemistries. Lithium cobalt, NMC, on those, the um, voltage weight ranges are wider. The BMS is, has a lot more function to work in. And therefore, there are more BMS related failures in LEFPO core batteries than in the other chemistries uh, due to the batteries drifting out of balance and the BMS not being able to correct it. So, this is what we found that in a lot of the cars that have been made by people with LAFPO4 batteries, usually hobbyists that have made their cars on those, the batteries aren't lasting the 10 or 15 years that they're supposed to um, because they're faulty. Um, there's been failures that have been occurring within one year, five years. A good BMS system might go for the 15 years of the battery. But uh, there's been a lot more failures in the LAFPO4 batteries. And if you were to try and use a simpler BMS system, such as a balance board on, on that, on an LEFPO4 battery, um, it will be more likely to fail. There, is, there are some people who build cars with LEFPO4 batteries and then they say, well, I'm going to balance it manually. I'm not going to bother using a BMS on those in there. And uh, the LEFPO4 battery actually is far more critical on having a BMS and keeping it balanced. Can we both go back two slides? Back again. First of all, because of this one here, the actual overvoltage characteristic. If um, if you try and charge an LEFPO4 battery without a BMS system on it, some of the cells will spike, what we call spike in voltage, and that will be damaged if you try and 100% charge it. So. Uh, it requires individual cell monitoring with LAFPO4 and the BMS system must be a lot more sophisticated, otherwise uh, damage will occur fairly, very quickly within the battery. Okay, we'll go forward. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was a new development in batteries. Well, it's not actually that new, it's been around for a while. They're going to now try and start using these within vehicles. This is a totally different concept of battery called the metal air battery. The metal air battery is lighter than the other type of batteries that we use because it only has one metal electrode. It only has the anode uh, within the actual battery itself. The cathode, the cathode of the battery is actually air. It uses air. It uses oxygen from the environment to um, to catalyze with the metal and produce the electricity. So. They're already, we're already looking at a third of the weight because there's no um, other um, electrode in there. But uh, this is a new design of battery that they're now testing and that and trying to get work with electric vehicles. Now all the current metal air batteries are not rechargeable. They haven't been able to make uh, a rechargeable type metal air battery well, that works and that lasts on those. Um, at the moment they're all not rechargeable. So metal air batteries are used in hearing aids, they're used in a number of other uh, products, but they're now looking at using them in a vehicle. But they can be recharged. You can recharge a metal air battery by replacing the metal plates. So like having a battery 
which you use it till it's flat and then you pull the metal plates out of it and replace them like a mechanical recharge system. Put a new plate in it and then it then goes off for its, um, its next range. So researchers are, are trying, they're working at the moment to try and create a metal air battery that's rechargeable. Go on. Now Tesla have taken a patent out of the US Patents Office for a car that uses a metal air battery. And people were wondering, you know, why would they do that? Why would Tesla take out such a patent? But they have, they've lodged one, and uh, this is the patent that Tesla's lodged. We have our motor, our drivetrain, we have our controller here, which is pretty standard in a normal vehicle. Then we have a non-metal air battery pack, which would be lithium ion, naturally, in a car. So you have this would be your standard battery pack, and then you have a second battery pack that's metal air. So you have two batteries within the vehicle. And so you'd wonder why they do that. Well, the reason they do that is the second battery is actually a range extender battery. It's a battery to enable the vehicle to go a long distance. Whereas the normal, the normal uh, lithium ion battery provides the current to run the motor and gives you the shorter, you know, the normal range. So the metal air battery is used to extend the range of a lithium ion car battery. And that's the concept of how they would use a metal, metal air battery at this stage until they work out how to make them rechargeable. We'll go to the next slide. So Tesla had lodged that patent and at the same time another company in Israel has actually produced a car with exactly the same technology. So I don't know what the patent's got to do with anything because someone else has already built one, always built one. And it might have been actually just after the patent was released. But this here is um, a car made by Finergy. It has a tri-metal battery in it, nickel, magnesium, cobalt, and also an aluminium air battery. By using the two batteries, you now have a range of 1,600 kilometers. So that's a real game changer, isn't it? And uh, it's been tested, and it uh, does have that range. So um, electric cars are going to be able to do going to be able to be produced with long ranges. Acceleration, 0 to 100 k's in 8.5 seconds, which is a bit slower than the, um, than the, the uh, Nissan uh, Leaf on those. It's not got the current performance, but you know, reasonable. But uh, where it exceeds is in range. So I'm going to show a video that now that will explain the metal air battery and how it's used in the car. <laughs> This is the battery and the boost. Yep. And what we have here is a 1,000 mile is extending on top of the energy you daily charge from the grid. So you've got a little lithium ion battery or whatever in there, uh, and you've also got this aluminium battery, and the alum aluminium, by reacting with the air and the water, it to be recharges the lithium. Now, that's great. If you want to see it, where's anode from aluminium? And this is. So there's the aluminium plate that makes the battery work. So it uses a reaction between aluminium and oxygen from the atmosphere. So when you produce aluminium, you're actually storing chemical energy in the aluminium. And if we look at this, not as dealing to a, a construction material as to store it. So we need to know how to discharge aluminium on time when we really need it. In order to do that, we have to have water, aluminium and air and grit using our proprietary air and fuel cathode a very thin layer, and I'll explain to you how it works. The interesting part is that the aluminum hydroxide, which is rough of aluminum, let's say, um, can be recycled. Actually, we can reuse it. It's not thrown away. It either be recycled back to the aluminum industry or diverted to a secondary market that can use this material for other reasons. So, 
a normal battery, uh, and we'll talk about many technologies. This is a normal battery. I was talking about the cathode. The this is the cathode. This is the anode. The and when 60, 70, 80 percent of the, the, the volume and weight usually lies in the cathode. And we can see it on the left side. And we call some kind of oxygen to do the, the reaction to release the energy from the anode. So we say, let's, let's throw it away, 80 percent of the weight, and let's uh, slide in this very thin uh, cathode. And this is actually what we have here. So this thin layer actually doing the task of the cathode just in time, breathing air from this side, and the catalyst on the other side sucking the water inside the battery, and actually release the energy from the volume. One barrel of gasoline can allow a car to drive about 3.5 thousand uh, kilometers. <laughs> one barrel of aluminum, in terms of carrying it around, can allow you to go 14,000 kilometers on a barrel of aluminum. <laughs> aluminum. So what about, instead of having this, we will have about 50 kilometers, a little worth of energy, and maybe 400, 500 worth of electricity that can be released by water that we can pump in. And this is the car that you can see outside, and I ran out of time. Right? <laughs> so let's go back to the slide, and I better explain it a bit more, because this concept is totally different. So he's, he's quoted six, uh, 1,600 kilometers range for the car on those, but I suppose he's made a statement there. He said, well, we can go a really long range on this car. But what you would do, you would have a, a lithium-ion battery that would have a short range, 60, 80, 100 kilometers or whatever it is. You know, you'd have a short range one. And then a aluminium air battery that would give you your extended range. Maybe 200 kilometers, 300, 400, 600 kilometers. You know, it depends on what you want to do. Because we don't need 1600 kilometers range out of the car. But what the, um, by having the two batteries, what that achieves is that you can have a lighter car because the lithium ion battery is smaller. And uh, when you need extended range, uh, the, alum the aluminium air or metal air battery and that is used. So it's like two battery systems within the same vehicle. So that's the concept of the car. To explain a little bit about the aluminium air battery, um, the aluminium air battery does have an electrolyte in it, which is um, potassium hydroxide. So there's, um, there's water, there's electrolyte within there, but it gets its oxygen from the atmosphere. So virtually there's, um, there's a catalyst within there that enables the aluminium to oxidize in the atmosphere. And as the aluminium is oxidized, it produces electricity. So we're now converting chemical, uh, chemical energy into electricity, which is just what, what any battery does. But in this case, it's the energy that's stored in aluminium. Uh, and then once it's oxidized, that uh, energy is released. And that aluminium can then be recycled. It's um, now um, hydroxide, aluminium hydroxide in solution. It can be reclaimed and recycled and put back into the cycle again. Now, I like the concept of this battery. No, no. What happens is the actual plate is eaten away within the battery, the aluminium plate. So the aluminium plate has to be replaced. Yeah, yeah, you'd be a mechanical type of recharging rather than electrical on those. So, uh, yeah, a new plate and that would need to be put inside the battery. It might even be a little bit more involved in sliding it in. But that would be nice if you could. But, yeah, it's, it's a different way of recharging a car. See, at the moment, they're not able to produce rechargeable uh, metal air batteries. They haven't got a design that works. So that's why they came up with this alternative. Yes? <laughs> Well, the um, the actual um, cathode of the battery is a 
permeable, me permeable membrane. <coughs> so it's actually a membrane that this particular com company, Finergy, has developed. We'll probably, we'll go back two slides. Uh, no, forward one. Yeah, I think we'll stick to there, probably the best way. Um, so that's a safety requirement, and yeah, I think you're right. You should be concerned about that because there is liquids within the battery. <coughs> but it has a permeable, permeable membrane that allows oxygen to enter from the atmosphere, but the liquid not to get out. Yes, Tom? Manufacturing of aluminium is very, very energy uh, intensive. Um, so uh, when you want <coughs> energy capacity stored in aluminium or various metals, you should refer it, you know, like to compare it with energy that is used to manufacture this aluminium from whatever ore, you know, like it is. Because this is the only difference. Only the difference between the two is actually meaningful. Very true, isn't it? So we probably have to look at the efficiency of the aluminium manufacturing industry and to see, you know, how much of that energy um, that is used in manufacturing aluminium actually ends up within the metal yes. and that as such. And how much is we can reclaim, you know, like, and also how much energy uh, it takes to recycle it back, you know, like uh, to, to produce aluminium. So, so we have to look at the whole cycle rather than have a snapshot, you know, like uh, uh, that could be misleading. Another, uh, uh, another issue is that when we put an energy, electrical energy, to produce uh, aluminium by electrolysis or whatever other processes that we use, the energy that comes in to produce aluminium is actually from fossil fuel in Australia. So uh, the footprint that we make using aluminium you know, like uh, it's very serious because the energy efficiency of our power station is about 20% fossil fuel. So it means that uh, from the coal, ground coal, 80% uh, of energy actually escapes the vinyl's chimneys, and only 20% goes into the electricity. Yes. So, in, uh, by producing right. aluminium, uh, that's the same issue yeah. that we had with uh, yeah. charging up your electric cars, regardless of the batteries. That's right. Yeah. Unless yeah. you are like me, you know, like it's powered by right. sun and wind, you know, like uh, then you know, I have no worries. You know, like I can charge for that. I would rather in, in Tasmania produce aluminium, so we can. So it's the source of the electricity that we're looking at, not that it is coal and Victoria that you can't. So that's so good. Yes, but we have to see the whole picture rather yeah, than the whole picture. only the, the, the whole potential of our Yes. We need to see a bigger picture. Yeah, the whole picture. Yes, that's right. This is new technology which is only just being developed as such. And yes, right, I'm showing the batteries in use within a vehicle. It's very true, isn't it? We have to look at if we want to um, make it um, sustainable, we have to look at all of the cycle, don't we, to make it sustainable as such on those. But um, yeah, just making the point that a lot of energy is stored in aluminium. And uh, aluminium air is only one type of um, metal air battery. There are actually other types in that as well. Lithium, lithium air was you know, much higher rated than aluminium. That's right, yes. It seems that they've, they've, they're building an aluminium air battery because they've been able to get the technology to work and it's something that they've been developing. But uh, I'm sure we'll see other ones come along as well. Let's go forward there. So, so here we have, this is a, the theoretical maximum energy densities that are available with these particular technologies, uh, with these chemistries and that I should say. So um, you can actually make a battery by uh, using any of the metals reacting with air. So zinc air is another well-known one. This is the one that the hearing aid batteries and that are made of. Zinc air batteries have been available for quite some time. And actually, it's the lowest energy density that you look at at the moment. But then again, some of these materials are quite uh, abundant in the earth, so on those. So that's another issue through there. So you can see the maximum. So our current um, energy density we're getting from batteries now, that's the um, NCR batteries that are used in the Model S, uh, 258 watt hours per kilogram. So you can see the scale the difference in that we're looking at there. We're looking at four times to twenty times, you know, the uh, the energy density on some of these batteries. So, uh, in the future, the energy energy density of a battery, like the problem we're having now, is probably not going to be an issue. On those, they'll be able to build electric cars, which uh, will have batteries that are quite light, 
on those and uh, be able to, yeah, yeah, to be light and those. It's probably more to do with cost and uh, which one performs better. But uh, anyway, so those are the uh, theoretical energy limits that are available with metal-air batteries. Uh, that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, any questions from the floor, even about um, BMSs or batteries or anything? The um, 18650 and 26650, so you can buy. They have an MBS BMS, some of them do. Yeah, it's about them. Yes. You want to take the question? Yeah, I'll repeat the question. I was asking about 18650 and 26650 batteries that have a built in uh, BMS and that built into the battery. And uh, are there any good on those was the question. Well, yes, you can buy these batteries and they're called a protective battery. You can buy 18650 batteries that have a protection um, built into them. I haven't used them. They are quite good on those. Whether they're suited to high current applications, I'm not sure. But the protection, uh, you can buy these lithium ion batteries with a protection model actually built into the battery. Next question. Yeah, you spoke about BMS for lithium ion phosphate. Yes. Recommend um, a lot of the work that I do is on electric bikes and a little bit on electric cars, but mainly electric bikes. So uh, with lithium ion phosphate, you do need a, a BMS system that has all three of those functions, uh, which is the high voltage protection, low voltage protection, and balance function on them. So uh, yeah, I would I would uh, look into the BMS that you were using and make sure that uh, that it was a good quality one that would work in that. No, I don't have enough experience to recommend one. This is with this problem of the BMS uh, not being able to balance very well. How can you overcome that by not charging the car so much or uh, charging it to full every time you use it? Um. Yeah, by not charging it to full every time you use it, by charging to 80% rather than to 100%, and then also not discharging it all the way, so leaving 20% of the capacity within the battery. Uh, those two ideas are a good idea to do uh, with that battery system. It really just depends upon how well the BMS has been manufactured on those and whether it's operating correctly within the battery. Uh, I would say uh, also doing internal resistance checks, checks on your battery every year, like going through and checking the internal resistance of each individual battery and replacing batteries that uh, are showing signs of age because you'll get a, a cascading effect through the battery if one of the cells fails. Um, so probably just doing a bit of maintenance and making sure that it has a good BMS system um, already. So what are you looking for with the resistance, internal resistance? We are looking for the internal resistance not to be, say, 30 or 40 percent higher than original manufacturer specs. So um, around that around that point, I'd start to become concerned that that particular battery needs to be replaced out of the pack. Yeah. Fuel gauges on uh, on lithium uh, iron phosphate batteries must be you know, must be really difficult to get right because the voltage difference between fully charged and fully discharged is very small. Um, that must be another reason to go to a, uh, um, a steeper curve, if you like, for the discharge. Curve. Yes, that's right. A, a voltmeter will still give you a, an indication of um, your charge on your um, lithium-ion battery, um, on your lithium-ion phosphate battery, though the voltage range is smaller, so you know, you're looking at uh, less differences in voltage. So you can still use a voltmeter on a lithium ion phosphate battery and see how charged it is. But um, a lot of the commercial um, systems that uh, monitor the batteries actually have a current sensor in the battery lead and they measure how much power has actually been taken out of the battery. So instead of um, the meter actually working on voltage, it actually measures how much, how many watt hours has been taken out of the battery and then gives you a percentage reading on the dash. Yes? The, um, uh, I think Prius batteries uh, are being recycled by Toyota and stationary batteries, uh, and probably others as well. And um, there's talk also of using them within 
about bike utilities or um, various deficits of the grid. Um, do these other chemistries lend themselves to those sorts of reuse? After that? And why is it that, that we seem to be having to remove the power when they apparently have lots and lots of service life in them? What is it they stop doing satisfactorily? This is a very interesting topic because, yes, it's very much, um, I've had a good look at this, and it's very true. Uh, they are, well, first of all, all the current chemistries uh, can be used for that purpose. You can take a battery out of a vehicle and then use it in a stationary storage application, and you'll get many more years' life out of it. Probably, you probably get double the amount of life out of it than what it had in the vehicle. So they can be used for quite a long time in stationary applications. The main reason that they take them out of vehicles is uh, a vehicle requires quite heavy currents for acceleration and for cruising at a reasonable speed. So the batteries um, and those are being operated under quite high currents uh, within a vehicle. And the internal resistance, what happens as a, as a battery ages, and I'll talk about lithium iron and lithium iron phosphate, all those ones, is um, they don't actually, they don't lose their capacity, they don't lose their ampere hour capacity as they age. What happens within the battery is that the, um, the internal resistance of the battery rises, the, and when you try and accelerate with a vehicle, you get voltage drop on those occurring within the battery. On those, so as the batteries reach their end of life, uh, the performance of the vehicle starts to drop off. On those, you don't get the acceleration. You do also lose a small amount. I'll say you will lose a small amount of the ampere hour capacity um, due to fracturing of the electrodes and that within the vehicle, uh, within the battery. But not a lot of the ampere hour is actually lost. It's actually the increase of internal resistance um, that is the issue within the vehicle. So that bit battery can be taken out of a vehicle, put into a stationary application where it's not stressed as low, where it might be run uh, well below its normal C capacity rating and it can be used for many, many more years on those and it will just gradually age, what we call age. As there's a calendar life on batteries, as they age and get older, their internal resistance starts to rise. The nickel metal hydride battery actually has different characteristics when it ages than lithium iron. Um, side reactions occur with the nickel metal hydride batteries and they develop very high leakages and other problems um, as they age. But the lithium ion battery especially is, is very good at ageing. It can be put into other applications. Um, just a bit like the Samba, the Samba project there he, where he was using used laptop batteries and testing them and wanting to build a battery pack for his car. Um, those batteries that he was testing, um, most of them had good capacity. Some of them were quite poor with their internal resistance. How many cost estimates for these batteries? Uh, uh, yeah, cost. Uh, he's asking about cost differences for the different types Sorry. of batteries. Yeah. Were well, you talking about the lithium, yeah. the different lithium batteries as such? Um, no, I didn't have a cost analysis on them, though we can see some that are obvious leaders, and uh, and that's the NMC battery, uh, the nickel magnesium cobalt battery. I would say companies such as uh, Mitsubishi and the IME and uh, the Nissan uh, Leaf, they chose that battery for its performance and obviously for its cost characteristics as well. Uh, the lithium cobalt batteries in 18650s are also uh, low, are lower in cost as well, and Tesla chose them for that reason because they could obtain them at a lower price. Yes, yeah, here. Fascinating presentation. Thanks so much, Paul. Okay. Um, two questions, if I may. Can you talk about how these batteries perform in a hot environment, i.e., where the environment we're in is already hot, like an Australian climate, as opposed to a European or an American climate? And secondly, could you talk a little bit about the current battery technology that's used in electric bikes? Okay. Well, first of all, temperature. The temperature related to the batteries and those, and temperature does have a huge effect on batteries. So that was a good, good point to bring up. Um, tests have been done on vehicles such as the Nissan Leaf. On those, there was a, a study done on Nissan Leafs all, all around the world, and they found that there was an enormous difference in the life of the battery depending upon the temperature of the environment in which the battery is used. 
uh, Nissan Leafs that were in Arkansas in America on those, which has one of the, the highest average um, temperatures, you know, a annual average temperatures. We're only achieving three or four years life for a, uh, for a Nissan Leaf battery, which is an NMC battery that we were talking about. Whereas that same battery, when being used in Norway or in another colder part of Europe, on those they are achieving calendar lives of 10 to 12 years. So that's an, it's quite a big difference, isn't it? An enormous difference in there. And that's been a concern for Nissan um, for selling cars in America and into hot climates, that the Nissan Leaf battery was not suitable, you know, while, while it was giving a poorer life in hot climates. And I think that could also be extended to other forms of lithium batteries as well, even though I haven't seen any real research in that. But um, also um, lithium-ion batteries, lithium cobalt on that, they have a calendar life. They age so much per year. And that calendar life is actually influenced by the temperature of the environment that they're kept in. So uh, if you keep your lithium-ion batteries in the fridge, you know, they would last you know, a long time and those and if they're in a hot climate and that they might. Now there's one more point I wanted to talk about temperature as well. It also affects the current that the battery can produce and um, the amount of power that the battery can produce. Some of the, some of the cars and bikes and that when they're um, driven in a cold environment you'll notice a loss of performance on those because the battery is not able to produce as much current as what it can in a high temperature environment. So the chemical reaction slows down within the battery in lower temperatures and you know if you're, riding, you're uh, driving your car and it's in freezing weather on those you will notice a difference in performance with lithium, lithium batteries. The second part of the question regarding e-bikes, wasn't it, yeah. on those. Um, and e-bikes on those, most of the e-bike batteries uh, that are built use lithium cobalt cells on those, they're the lowest cost, the highest energy, uh, they're the lightest batteries and that to be used within e-bikes. So lithium cobalt is very popular in that in e-bike batteries. But we're now starting to see e-bike batteries change to NMC as well, the trimetal batteries, because they have a longer life uh, within an e-bike battery than the lithium cobalt batteries had. You know, they'll, they'll be able to produce e-bike batteries that last five, seven years on those, whereas the lithium cobalt e-bike batteries have a hard life. Some of the money lasts two or three years sometimes. Uh, yes, Tom? I would like to maybe add some uh, temperature effects. Uh, two years ago, we had a presentation in this room from CSIRO scientists about thermal effects on lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. And his message was, or research uh, result was, that uh, lithium battery uh, heated above 50 degrees loses some percentage of capacity permanently every time it is heated above 50 degrees. Okay. When it's cooler, uh, the cooler temperatures uh, uh, result in loss of capacity, but this capacity is fully restored when the battery is warmed up to the lower temperature. So 50 degrees okay. was the message, you know, like uh, the, the threshold above which, you know, like uh, there is some, you know, like a uh, damage to the battery cap uh, capacity. Oh, the, that would make sense. This Could is, you case. know, like a result from CSIRO, from a public presentation at ATA meeting, you know, like uh, maybe two years ago. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks for that, Tom. Mm. Yes. Tesla released the uh, S with a 40 kilowatt hour, 65 and 85 kilowatt hour battery. Okay. They dropped the 40. And I can't help you get a nightmare as to how much difference roughly in cost it would be between 65 and 85. And why don't they make them all 85? Oh, okay. Um, well, first of all, Panasonic make um, three standards of NCR 18650 batteries. So um, they make, well, the A and B is the most popular type, and those one's 2.9 ampere hour, and the other one's 3.4 ampere hour. So I would assume in the higher, the longer range, the, the larger battery, they're using the um, the more expensive, the 3.4, you know, the the A batch, you know, the best batch on those out of the batteries and those from Panasonic. So I think the smaller battery was dropped the 60, did you say, was it 40? 40, 40, 40, yeah. 
So the smaller 40, I think, was dropped because customers didn't want it on those and they just didn't get, really get any demand for it. People were buying the, the higher two batteries. But of course, um, it must be more expensive because you're building a larger battery, so the cost of the battery is scaled with the size. Yes. Yes. Um, can you speak at all about costs and advantages and disadvantages of different types of stationary applications, like a lot of people want to add storage to their house? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. On those, of course, um, well, I haven't had a lot of experience in that area, only a bit. On those, of course, uh, the lead acid battery has been the ruler, you know, in stationary applications for quite some time. On those, and you can buy deep cycle lead acid batteries that are long life on those that will last 10, 12 years on those, you know, not like a car battery that only lasts three years or so. So they, they've been the rule of for, the, for quite some time. But um, LIF, LIFEPO4, lithium ion phosphate battery, is now starting to move into uh, solar and stationary appliances because it is the lowest cost of the lithium ion chemistries. Uh, it has a very long life. It can last 15, 18 years in a stationary appliance you know, application like that. So your cost return there with the, the longer life on those. So um, LEFPO4 batteries are now starting to be used more in stationary in some of the newer systems. Though I still think the lead acid one is still very good in comparison in price. Yes, the back. LTO batteries we haven't mentioned, which are sort of one step below the liquid phosphate, which apparently they take a 2.3 volts, if I'm very right, and they take a very high discharge or charge count. They're used now for SFA and some people in the grid. Oh, yeah. But, uh, so does anyone know that type of battery at the LTO? Titanate. Titanate or yeah, Titanate? Like LTO is the sort of oh, yeah. I suppose I haven't mentioned it because it doesn't seem to be yeah, used in vehicles. It's in the middle of the, mm. uh, one step below lithium phosphate as far as density goes, but it's a bit tougher and it'll take a, a very high input and output current. Oh, good. No, I don't know the battery and no, I haven't put it ahead in my There's display. There's a few listed around. Um, Senyo makes some, but yeah, finding information about them is not that. It's quite a bit there, but not. Mm. Okay, can't help with that one. No, yeah. maybe last question. Uh, another question. I have some comments about stationary energy storage because I've got uh, some personal experience with it because I live off grid, you know, like there. Yeah. And uh, a few years ago, I decided to install uh, nickel iron batteries. Nickel iron batteries, they have a lifespan maybe 100 years, 200 years. They don't mind being, you know, totally discharged, and you can't really damage them, you know, any other way, you know. Like, and if they lose too much, too much capacity, you just uh, uh, change the electrolyte. Yeah. So uh, the, the, uh, one of the experiments I did, I installed it uh, to my GP, a lady, you know, like who has no idea about, you know, energy efficiency or anything. And she's discharging those batteries daily, you know, like to zero, you know, like, and uh, they don't die, you know, like, so uh, yeah, the batteries yes. that Edison constructed uh, 100 years ago, they are still working today. Yes, I've heard of them used in telephone exchanges on those, they're quite good. Well, we're going to have some um, supper now. I know to have a chat over a cuppa and things, so Dean's going to wind the meeting up. Yeah, so uh, thanks again, Paul, for uh, displaying. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks, Paul, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go uh, next door and uh, have some tea and biscuits, and you can uh, mine Paul for some more information and uh, have a look at his uh, a few of the batteries and inverters and uh, little bibs and bobs that uh, that he makes industriously on his kitchen table. Okay, thank you.